Well, you know that today is Palm Sunday, the first day of Holy Week, and uh, I want to talk about the events in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago on Palm Sunday, and I want to talk about Monday, Thursday as well. And on your own, I hope you will read about uh, the terrible events on Good Friday and then come back here next Sunday ready to celebrate the Easter miracle. So during the week, I hope that you will be reading in your Bible and hearing from the pulpit uh, all of the events, all the major events that happened during Holy Week. The most important days, really, in the history of the world, certainly Easter Sunday itself. And my sermon is entitled, Blessed is He Who Comes in the Name of the Lord. And uh, these words were shouted by the crowds as Jesus rode his donkey into Jerusalem. Now, almost all of his preaching up until this time had been in the rural areas of the country. But the people in the big city of Jerusalem, and by the way, it was big, even by today's uh, standards, they had heard about his miracles, they had heard about his teaching, and some of them had actually observed them, but for most it was word of mouth, and they wanted to come out and see him for themselves. And they saw a man riding on a donkey coming into their city. And it was not a symbol of humility. It was a symbol of royalty. And all of the people understood. The Jews, even though they didn't live the, the text that they had memorized, many of them had memorized their scriptures. And they knew of the scripture that the Messiah would come riding a donkey. And Jesus chose his symbol very, very carefully when he said that he would ride a donkey, when he told his disciples to find a donkey, he would ride into the town. He knew exactly what he was doing. The people knew what he was doing. And uh, most tragically, the Pharisees knew what he was doing. And I'm going to read the account in the Gospel of John. So if you'll turn to John chapter 12, verse 12, if you'll follow along with me, You can read the account of Palm Sunday in other Gospels, but it's the last verse of this account that I really want to emphasize. John chapter 12, beginning at verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's coat. At first, his disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. Now this verse is not included in the other Gospels. Verse 19. So the Pharisees said one to another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And you know that the Pharisees were the religious leaders, and they were the enemies of Jesus. And it's pretty clear here that when they saw that the crowds uh, were so enthusiastic and that they were proclaiming him basically uh, to be the fulfillment of the Messiah, the scripture predicting the coming of the Messiah, they had decided that they would have to shut him up. They would have to put him to death. The people put down palm branches for him to ride over. That's why it's called Palm Sunday. And uh, that too is symbolic. Uh, It was a sign of royalty 
Kings would come, and they would ride over palm branches. Uh, there's all kinds of symbolism here. But what we need to realize is that Jesus is proclaiming, in truth, that he was the Messiah. It's quite a spectacle. Jesus was at the height of his popularity. And some have said he could have led a revolution if he had wanted to at that point. He was so popular, and the crowds were so enthusiastic. But, you know, a man of lesser uh, character may have been caught up by the praise. But Jesus knows how fickle we are. He knows that even us Christians, even we Christians, you know, we can come to church on Sunday and, 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 and sing our hymns and pray and, and proclaim God as our Father and Jesus as our Savior, and then we can go out into the world and live for the rest of the week as if God doesn't even exist. And so Jesus knew how fickle people could be. And he knew that, that even this crowd, even some of the same people in this crowd, would be a part of another crowd just five days later, a mob, that wouldn't be uh, hailing him as the Messiah, but they would be demanding that he be crucified. There's no doubt in my mind, some of the same people were in both groups. So he's not all that impressed by the acclaim of this crowd, just as he was not surprised <clears throat> by the opposition of, of the mob on Good Friday. Now, I want to fast forward four days to Monday, Thursday, because really this is all that can be said about Palm Sunday. It's a wonderful, symbolic kind of thing. Jesus comes into the capital city of Jerusalem, and he is proclaimed. People are agreeing that he is proclaiming himself to be the Messiah. But it goes downhill quickly from there. On Thursday, Jesus meets with his disciples. Now, we call this Monday Thursday. We're going to have a Monday Thursday service here, and I hope that you will come. <clears throat> when I was pastor, we used to have a covetous supper prior to the service because I wanted us to kind of pattern what we were doing after what the disciples experienced. In other words, when they were meeting in the upper room with Jesus for their meal, they were, they were happy. They were excited. They were always happy when they were Je with, with Jesus. And when we have a covered this supper, it's great when the congregation comes together. We enjoy each other's company. But then we would come upstairs, and I would try for it to be the most solemn service it could possibly be, to mirror how Jesus changed the atmosphere completely. You know, the disciples are so happy to be in the presence of Jesus. They had seen the, the multitudes, the crowds, cheering him and proclaiming him to be the Messiah. And then Jesus says, this is the last meal we will have together. I'm going to be killed. How things change. And it is there that Jesus institutes the ordinance of, of communion, as we call it, the Lord's Supper. You know, he passes around the, the bread and the cup and says, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This, is, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. And the disciples are flabbergasted. They're brokenhearted. They really don't understand what he is trying to say, but they do what he tells them to do. And then he says, and one of you is going to betray me. And they say, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? And somehow it kind of gets lost in all this that Judas walks out. It's as if no one even noticed that that had happened. Jesus 
takes Peter, James, and John, his three closest disciples, and they go out into the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, this is not like the garden in your backyard. This is a big wooded area, and uh, very quiet, very still, and uh, he tells them he wants them to pray for him. He says, I really need you. In effect, he's saying, I have always been here for you, to pray for you. Now I need you to pray for me. And so the three men pray, and he says, I'm going to go up uh, and be alone in prayer for a few moments. But I'm leaving you. Please pray for me. And of course, what did they do? Right, they fell asleep. They didn't want to fall asleep. You know, it had been a long day. It had been an exciting week. They were in this secluded, peaceful, beautiful place. And uh, they're alone, and they fell asleep. Jesus goes on alone by himself, and we're told that he is in agony. Just think what it would be like if you knew that you were going to be crucified, that you knew that as the Son of God, that you would be separated from God the Father for the first time in all of the eons of eternity. You would be cut off from a part of yourself. You would be absolutely, totally alone, and you had never known loneliness and to know that you would be betrayed by one of your own disciples, and you would have to experience the incredible torture of crucifixion. I think most experts consider crucifixion uh, to be the most brutal and painful form of of, uh, capital punishment ever devised by man. You know, people, the Romans crucified hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of people, And they would just leave them hanging on their crosses for long periods of time. So when the people would walk by, they would see these bodies. And uh, it was a warning. You know, if you get out of line, this can happen to you. Death from crucifixion came by uh, suffocation. Uh, They died because they couldn't breathe. They couldn't take another breath. And again, death usually took more than a day. Jesus knew what was going to happen to him. He knew how painful the experience was going to be. But most of all, he knew that he was going to be cut off from God the Father. And so he says, Father, if it's possible for this cup to pass from me, then let it be. But then what did he say? but not my will, but your will be done. And so he goes back to his three most trusted disciples who he had asked to pray for him, and they are sound asleep. And he awakens them, and he probably was thinking, I wish you could sleep now. I wish you could sleep through the next three days. I wish you could miss all of what's going to happen, particularly this very night. But he awakens them and says, now it's time. Now it's time. Judas appears with the Roman soldiers. Jesus is taken prisoner. Uh, He is taken to the Sanhedrin, which was the uh, Jewish religious court. And he is tried for blasphemy, which means claiming to be God and, of course, not being God. So he's not being tried by the Romans. He's being tried by the Jews. He's being tried by these same Pharisees who saw him, saw all the people praising him on Palm Sunday, saying, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. They decided they had to put this to an end. And so they charge him with blasphemy. You know, how many people in the world consider to be Jesus a great man? Probably just about everybody in the world. 
of all religions consider Jesus to be a great man. But only Christians, and unfortunately, not all people who call themselves Christians, consider him to be the Son of God. Well, you know, you can't have it both ways. When they ask him in the trial, are you the Son of God? In effect, he said, yes, I am. He answered it very clearly, not in those words, not the way it's translated, but that's what he said, I am. What would you think of someone who walked around the streets of Fredericksburg claiming to be God? Would you think he was a great man? Probably not. You would think he was either insane or a pathological liar. You know, Jesus hasn't given us the option of saying, oh, he was a great man, but he wasn't who he said he was. He said he was the son of God. You know, you've got to accept him either as the savior, who he claimed to be, or someone who knowingly lied about the situation. And it's funny how most people just, they just don't get that. They don't understand that. I guess they don't want to even think about that. But in conversations with people who tell you that, that Jesus was a great man but not the Son of God, you may just bring it to conversation. Well, he said that he was the Son of God and he was willing to die on a cross saying that he was the son of God. He died because he said he was the son of God. So, at least he must have thought that. Jesus is found guilty in a trumped-up charge, a kangaroo court. It was a midnight uh, convening of the court, which was against the Jewish religious law, but they did it nevertheless. And then he is taken to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. Now, the Jews could find someone guilty, but only the Romans could execute someone because it was the Romans who were in charge. So the Jews who despised the Romans, nevertheless, they had to take Jesus to the Roman governor, and he would be the one who would pronounce uh, the sentence. He would be the one who would decide if Jesus would be crucified. And uh, we're getting to the events of Good Friday. I'd almost like to talk about them a little bit on Sunday, just to draw the contrast between the horror of, of the crucifixion and the unbelievable miracle and joy of Easter but I guess I'll just talk about the resurrection on Easter. So I hope on your own you will read in Scripture about what happened on Good Friday. How Pontius Pilate, knowing that Jesus was not guilty of any charge for which he should be executed, and yet knowing that the people were demanding that he be crucified, and knowing that he was on thin ice because there had been riots in other places where he had been the governor and the emperor of Rome was not happy with him at all and if there had been another riot, he may have lost his position. And the Jews were, were threatening to riot, at least the crowd was giving that, that impression. And uh, what did he do to try to, to get himself out of the, out of the situation? He washed his hands of the whole matter, and, and he came up with uh, something that the Roman governor did once a year during the Passover, which was what? Yeah, he could free one prisoner. And who was the prisoner that he... Barabbas, which was really pretty, pretty stupid on the part of Pontius Pilate if he really wanted to free Jesus because Barabbas was not only a murderer, but he was a revolutionary. He hated the Romans. He was leading revolts against the Romans, and he let the people decide. 
And the people all hated the Romans. So if they had a choice, they were going to free somebody that they probably considered to be a hero. And uh, at any rate, Jesus is condemned to die, is beaten. And uh, again, read the story on your own. So what starts off on Palm Sunday as, as an incredible, wonderful day when the people are proclaiming that Jesus, rightly so, is the Messiah that had been promised and that they had been waiting for for so long. Within five days, turns into a hideous, hideous kind of disaster. And that just makes what happened on Sunday that much more incredibly wonderful, doesn't it? And uh, I'm going to really enjoy talking about Easter Sunday next week. And I hope that you'll be here. And I hope that you will bring friends with you. Uh, if ever there's a time to be in church, next Sunday will be the time. And I think some of the things that I'm going to say uh, will, will be meaningful to friends of yours who may not normally come to church. At least I hope that will be the case. Uh, the most important day in the history of all the world. Once and for all, it was decided that good would overcome evil, that life would overcome death. We had a funeral in here yesterday, and this sanctuary was absolutely packed, packed. And even though it was, you know, it was a funeral, we were able to celebrate because the man was a very strong Christian, a member of this congregation. And we could celebrate because of what happened on that Easter Sunday that we will be celebrating next week. I hope that you'll come, and I hope that you will think about what is your relationship to God? Is it something that you hold on to seven days a week, or are you like the crowd and, uh, you know, you... You reach out to God and, and you let other people know you're a Christian and then the next day, particularly if you're under some pressure, you remain silent. Let's pray about it. Lord, I know that I've outlined a story that everyone in here is familiar with. But we need to think about it often to think that you would take our frame and come into this world to lower yourself that much and then allow yourself to be put to death for us. And then from the cross to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And Lord, we know that you were talking, he was talking about us when we turn our backs on you, when we refuse to, to talk to others about you. Lord, we thank you for your blessings, but we pray that this week, this holy week, will inspire us to go out and be the people that you created us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.